Well, if you watched the news this week, you might have seen that there was a celestial object in the sky that was garnering a lot of attention. But I'm not talking about the balloon, okay? I wonder how many pastors use the balloon as their illustration today. I guess I kind of just did. But that's actually not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Jupiter. You might have seen sort of buried in the news stories this week that we've discovered that Jupiter has 12 more moons than we previously thought that it had. So now Jupiter boasts 92 total moons in its orbit, meaning it has surpassed Saturn as the planet in our solar system with the highest number of moons. So we think, okay? Here's what stands out to me about this. So often we think we know right we think we have it all figured out and then all of a sudden there's new information there's a new experience something new happens and we realize we didn't know as much as we thought we did before the new information came some of you have seen images for the last year or so coming back to us from the webb telescope the james webb telescope It's a much upgraded version of the Hubble telescope that we used to see images from in the past. And the Webb telescope is sending back to us these incredible images of the cosmos. Things that that we've never seen before or things that we're now seeing in higher definition than we've ever seen before. And it just reminds us that, that the creation that God has made, the only limits that it has are the limits that he knows. We don't know. We don't understand. We don't have it all figured out. But when we have those moments that God shows us something new that we've never seen before, do we see it or do we miss it? Do we appreciate it and are we thankful for it or do we resist it? As we begin the month of February, for the next four Sundays, we're going to be talking about missions. And we're not just going to be talking about missions in some far off sense. But we're going to be talking about missions even as God gives us opportunities as close as crossing the street from where we live. And my prayer for us is that this would not just be a missions emphasis month so that we think, okay, we're talking about missions in February, but then we're putting it on the shelf and not thinking about it again. No, my prayer for us is that we would spend these next few Sundays seeing how God has on his heart all the time love for the nations and that God's love for the nations is woven into the identity that we are to have as his disciples as those who follow in his footsteps and I'm also praying that when we hopefully see some things with a wider lens than perhaps we've seen before or God shows us some things that we thought we knew or we thought we had figured out but now we see it in a new way that we would not resist but that we would have eyes to see that we would have ears to hear that we would have open hearts that we would have generous hands and that we would have obedient feet and what i mean by that is feet that walk as disciples and in obedience are willing to go wherever god might lead our feet to go whether it is far away or whether it's as we said right across the street i'm praying as we talked about throughout our study of romans 12 that we would respond with surrender and that we would say to the lord what whatever it is you want me to see and however it is you want me to respond i want to have eyes to see and i want to respond as you lead me as we dig deeper into some missions texts this month I'm praying that we will see what it means to be great commission disciples, but also kingdom-minded disciples. And where we're going to begin this morning is talking about the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but for me, one of the strangest passages of Scripture is the story that Matthew records and Luke records of Jesus being tempted by the devil. When the devil takes Jesus out into the wilderness for 40 days he's tempted and then somewhere in the process we find out three specific ways that satan decided to tempt jesus 
And one of the amazing things that happens in that passage, again, it's in Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, Luke, Luke chapter 4, is that Jesus gives us a model for how we ought to deal with temptation, how we ought to fight temptation when we face it in our lives. Because what does Jesus do when Satan tempts him? Every single time Jesus responds to the temptation by quoting scripture back at the devil. Jesus knew and he modeled for us that our best offensive weapon against evil and sin and temptation is the word of God. And every time Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus responded by quoting Deuteronomy and he, he attacked that temptation by quoting the words of the Lord. The last of those three temptations that are mentioned specifically is the moment when, Jesus, when Satan took Jesus up to a very high place and Satan tempted him by saying, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world that you can see if only you will bow down and worship me. Now think for a moment about that temptation in those words from the devil to Jesus. Satan may have some limited authority in terms of the kingdoms of the world, but who is he to offer Jesus anything, the Son of God anything, as if he has some authority over Jesus? But we see in those words just how arrogant Satan is, how ignorant he is, and also that anything he promises us, it's an empty promise. Because Satan offered Jesus something in this situation that he had no authority to give. And Jesus responded to the devil, quoting scripture, away from me, Satan, for the Bible says you shall worship and serve God alone. And after resisting that temptation, after resisting the temptation that many others have fallen for, for, for wealth and for power, for the kingdoms of this world, Jesus then began preaching about the kingdom. And what we find throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is that Jesus talked about the kingdom, whether the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, using that language, Jesus talked about the kingdom more than any other topic. He talked about the kingdom more than love. He talked about the kingdom more than sin, more than the law, more than the church. He talked about the kingdom more than heaven or hell. He talked about the kingdom even more than death and resurrection. And so if it, the heart of Jesus preaching and teaching and message is this thing we call the kingdom of God what better place for us to start as we think about God's love for the nations and what our role looks like in it than with the kingdom of God itself as we go through this month again we're starting with the kingdom today we're also going to talk some about the global church this morning, the Flores family were our, our first global church moment. We're going to have one of those each Sunday as we go through this month, where some of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are members of our church remind us that Jesus Christ is worshipped in lots of different languages and lots of different ways all over the world. This morning, they read a psalm for us in English and Spanish. They read some words from a worship song that is special to their family. And as we go through this month, I want us to see, perhaps with a bigger lens than we're used to seeing, just how active God is around the world through the global church, and how that's even true right here in our community. And at the center of all of that is the kingdom of God at work around the world. We'll talk this month about the mission of God and the movement of God the way God moves in people and the way God moves people according to his will. And we'll also be talking about our victory in Christ. And I'm excited about that Sunday. The victory that we have, all of us who are in Christ, whether you're a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, Jew or a Gentile, slave or free, we are one in Christ Jesus and we share in his victory. And so we have a lot to look forward to this month as we dig into these scriptures together. But as we begin with the kingdom this morning, this short text that we read was on an occasion where 
the Pharisees asked Jesus a question. And in his response to the question, Jesus gave just a little bit of teaching. And in the midst of that teaching, Jesus gave an earth-shattering revelation that echoes into our lives and what it means to be disciples and the church today. The question that the Pharisees asked, beginning there in verse 20 on one occasion, they asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? That was the question. When will the kingdom of God come on the earth? Now, with what we know about the Pharisees and other stories of Scripture, we might assume that they were asking Jesus this question to trap him or to trick him. But the reality is, if, if you survey the, the, the writings and the teachings of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, those that are in Scripture, but others that exist outside of the Scripture that, that relate to the historical existence of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you'll see that oftentimes they were obsessed with this idea of when will the kingdom of God come. Sometimes they would call it the day of the Lord. Sometimes they would call it the day of salvation. Usually what they were talking about was the moment that they believed that the Messiah was going to come and free them from the oppression of the Romans. And when he freed them from the oppression of the Romans, it would also be like the Psalms described. They believed that God was going to put their enemies underneath their feet and they would have victory. So when the Pharisees, the teachers of the law and others we're talking about when will the kingdom of God come? When will the day of the Lord be here? When will the day of salvation come? For them, it mostly meant a political victory, a military victory, freedom from the oppression they were experiencing in the moment. Oftentimes when we use this language, we think of it more in terms of when will Jesus return? And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But as the Pharisees asked this question, whatever their motivation was, it's interesting to consider what had just happened in the story right before they asked this question. It's actually a fairly well-known story where Jesus healed 10 people. He was on his way from Galilee to Jerusalem. He was going through Samaria. And you might remember the story, the 10 lepers come. Jesus heals them all when they call out to be healed. But how many came back and said, thank you? Do you remember the story? Just one. And it's right after this story of, of the healing of the ten that obviously had to have been shared from one place to another that the Pharisees asked this question. It's almost like they're saying the healings aren't enough. The ministry that you're doing is not enough. This is pretty far into the Gospel of Luke. The signs that we've seen through you, Jesus, have not been enough. When will the kingdom of God come on the earth? The sad reality throughout the Gospels is that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the most educated, the most religious, the most privileged, almost always completely missed the miraculous things that God was doing right in front of their faces through Jesus Christ. How is it possible that they could have seen the healings and the ministry and the work that God was doing and still ask a question like this to Jesus? When will the kingdom of God come? But as we see in the next part of the text, as Jesus responds, they were looking everywhere for the kingdom of God to be revealed, except looking at that which was right in front of their face and happening right in front of them every day. And so Jesus responds, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed nor will people say, here it is, or there it is. The word that Jesus uses for observed, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. It's actually a very interesting word. The word in Greek is the word parateresis. And in, in common language, there were lots of different ways that people would use this word observed. And oftentimes it related to looking for signs. So Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, it's not something that should just be about looking for the signs. For the Jews, this word parateresis, it meant looking for the signs of the apocalypse, the signs of the end of the world. They might have looked for those in the scripture. They might have looked for those in the teachings of the rabbis or 
things that were happening on the world scene. For the Hellenists, the Greek philosophers, that word observed meant looking at the sky and observing the stars and the signs and, and trying to read them and make sense of them and, and understand what do those signs mean as we observe them. For others, it was a medical term to observe the, the symptoms that were happening in the body to be able to identify disease. And in each case, looking for a sign, looking for something that, that would show us something on the surface that means there's a deeper meaning behind it and something that we ought to see. The truth is we really haven't moved that far away from the ancient world and our obsession for looking for signs. In fact, that happens all the time in church, doesn't it? We, we want to look at the signs of, of the times and the events that are happening around us and try to put all the pieces of the puzzle together, right? So we can say, say Jesus is about to return. That, that part of the kingdom is about to come really soon. It's interesting how throughout the centuries, as Christians have looked for the signs, they always seem to be very ethnocentric signs, like they're all about what's happening to us, whether or not that is true. Jesus told us in Acts chapter 1, do not spend your time worrying about times or dates, but rather live for God's glory every day and watch as the Holy Spirit through his power works through you. Yet even knowing that Jesus told us not to worry about times and seasons and dates, we still do it. I shared this book with you all several years ago when I first came here as pastor. I, I mentioned it, but I'd never actually seen a copy. And one of our church members actually gave me this copy. Miss Rhonda back here in the choir gave me her copy of 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. You ever heard of this book? 88 reasons why Jesus will return in 1988 as we sit here in 2023 I don't think this was correct what's amazing about this is this author actually published the next year 89 reasons Jesus will return in 89 because he said I missed it by one and people still bought the book the second time we're not so far removed for from looking at signs and, and looking to the skies and trying to find a, some way to, to nail down the time or the date. I love the way the ancient Christian Cyril of Alexandria said it. We talk about the global church. Here's an ancient Christian from Egypt. And Cyril of Alexandria said this, rather than worrying about the times and the seasons when the kingdom of heaven will come, be eager that you may be found worthy of it when it comes. I love that, that idea. It's the same thing Jesus taught us. Rather than looking for the, the signs and always being obsessed with here it is and there it is, watch carefully, but live in such a way that you are eager to be found worthy of the kingdom when it comes. And I will tell you this, when, when we're speaking of the return of Christ, that is not something we're going to miss when it happens, okay? Okay. Now, some people might not be prepared, but when Christ returns, we won't have to say, wait, is that it, or is it here, or is it, is it there? When Jesus Christ returns again to the earth, there will be no doubt, and we will worship him as king, as will every knee bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so Jesus is saying, and remember, he's talking to the Pharisees, you don't have to hunt for the kingdom for the same reason Jesus is saying to us we don't have to hunt for the kingdom because the kingdom of God is in your midst. In his response to their question comes the earth-shattering revelation. The kingdom of God is not just out there and it's not just far off and it's not just in another age or in another time and season. No, the kingdom of God is actually here now, and it is in your midst. Now, some of your translations might say, because the kingdom of God is in you. Or others might say something like, because the, the kingdom of God is within your grasp. But what we need to note here is the word your is plural, okay? It's not singular. So it's not as if Jesus pointed out one person in the crowd and he said the kingdom of God is in you 
And another reason we ought to question that, that singular idea is because, again, who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. And think about some of the words Jesus often used to describe most of the Pharisees. You guys are hypocrites. You guys are like blind guides. You're like a brood of vipers. You're like snakes. You Pharisees are like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you are full of nothing but death. And so I don't think Jesus is saying to one of the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is in you, though he might be saying it could be in you, right, if you would, would follow me. But he's saying it to them as a group. The kingdom of God is in your midst. And if, if the idea is it's within your grasp, the, the power of the kingdom is within your grasp, the kingdom of God is in your midst. But, but here's what I really think this means. Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is in your midst because the king is here. Jesus Christ, the king, is here. And where the king is, the kingdom is present. And, and everything that, that comes under his authority is part a part of the kingdom so what is there that doesn't come under christ's authority the kingdom is here because the king is here and actually probably the best way to read this last part of this text is how it literally is written in the word order it goes something like this for behold the kingdom of god in the midst of you is it might help if you read it sort of like like you hear yoda hear yoda's voice in your mind for behold the kingdom of god in the midst of you is and and the reason that word order is so important is because it drives the point home the kingdom's not just there or here or out there somewhere the kingdom of god is it is here now it exists in our lives is there an aspect of the kingdom that is future absolutely Theologians like to say it like this the kingdom of God is already and not yet There's a not yet element to the kingdom that we won't experience in its fullness until either we leave this life Or Christ returns So if we ask the question is the kingdom of God something we'll experience later or is the kingdom of God something we can experience now? The answer is yes, it's both There are some not yet elements to the kingdom that we won't experience until we leave this life or Christ returns. But there is an already aspect to the kingdom because the king has been here and the king has promised us that he is with us always to the very end of this age, right? That's a part of the Great Commission text. Go in into all nations and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and remember... I am with you always to the end of the age because the king is present the kingdom is here and we have kingdom opportunities in front of us every single day not just those that are far off and not just those that belong to the clergy or the professional Christians like us right we have kingdom opportunities in front of us every single day if only we will have eyes to see and we will say, God, where your kingdom is at work, that's where I want to be and that's where I want to be a part. Remember what we talked about back in Romans 12. Every single one of us has something to offer. Every single one of us has something to contribute when it comes to the work of the kingdom and the ministry of the church. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. It doesn't matter if you're a male or a female. It doesn't matter what your, your, your social standing is, your life status or circumstances. As members of the body of Christ, we all have something to offer. And where God's kingdom is at work around us, don't we want to be a part of that? Sometimes it feels like the darkness is winning, right? It feels that way. We look around at our world and how sick it is and how sinful it is and how evil it is. We look at how many people seem to hate God and they seem to hate God their neighbor and they seem to just hate in general and living as a, a follower of christ in this strange time in this messed up world can be a really really difficult thing to do 
But whenever we feel like the darkness is winning, we remember that God's kingdom is a kingdom of light. And that kingdom of light is advancing. It is not retreating. The Bible says it this way. The light is already shining. The true light of the kingdom in Jesus Christ is already shining. And because of that, the darkness is not advancing. The darkness is passing away. The true light is shining and the darkness cannot apprehend it, Scripture says, because the light is outpacing the darkness. And because the kingdom of God is advancing as a kingdom of light, there will come a day when the fullness of the kingdom is here. There will be no more darkness left. Only light will remain. It's not a give and take. It's not an equal fight. The light is overwhelming the darkness and the darkness is passing away. I came across this word recently, an English word I'd not heard before, benighted. And it's not like knight with a K, so it's not becoming a, a royal knight. And some of you may have heard this word used to describe somebody who's dim-witted, they're benighted. But, but ultimately where this word's come, word comes from is from mountain climbing and hiking. And you'll even see it if you're an, an avid hiker. The warning, make sure you get off the mountain early enough so that you don't become benighted. In other words, as you're hiking and the sun sets and night sets in very quickly, the conditions can change on you and things can become very dangerous. So as you're climbing, don't become benighted. This word is the opposite of what the kingdom of God is doing. The kingdom of God is not benighting, it be lighting, right? <laughs> the kingdom of God is advancing as light into the darkness, and the darkness is passing away. And the only reason we can believe that is because we believe that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And because he is the light of the world, the true light is already shining, and the darkness is passing I love the way Frank Fu, one of our members, talked about this in our perspectives class this week. He said it's, it's like a sunrise. The sun is rising and it continues to rise and, and as the sun, the light of the kingdom is rising, things are getting brighter and brighter. The only difference being that the sun of the kingdom will never set. The sun will only continue to rise. The light will only continue to shine in the darkness and the darkness my brothers and sisters, my friends, it will pass away. Do you believe this morning that the kingdom of God is in our midst? If you believe that, my prayer for us is that we would not miss it. That we would not miss where the kingdom is at work. And if there are things in our lives that are tempting us to miss it, we have to ask the question, is it going to be worth it? Is it going to be worth it to chase after those things and miss it? Or will we be those who have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, the hearts that are open, the hands that serve, and the feet that walk in obedience to all the places that God's kingdom would take us? As you consider these words, the kingdom is not here or there, the kingdom is it is in your midst. We know and believe this morning that the kingdom is in our midst because the king is here. May we not miss it, but may we be people of the kingdom who walk as citizens of the kingdom, and may we be a community of the kingdom that walks faithfully in obedience as disciples as Christ leads us forward. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you today that the kingdom of God is here. You are working in our hearts. You are working within our grasp. You are working in our midst, in our community around the world. And Lord, we need only to open our eyes to see you as you are truth, as you are light, and believe and follow the light into the darkness. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful as kingdom citizens, that we would serve you as our king above all kings, and that our citizenship in your kingdom would be first and foremost in our lives. And I pray that we would be a kingdom community, that this church would be faithful as a local body that's part of your 
your global body, that we would be faithful with the responsibilities you've given us. And Lord, that we would have that, that service-minded, mission-minded, kingdom-minded perspective. And Lord, that we would not miss the ways you are working and, and leading us forward. I pray today if there's anyone who in their heart feels distant from you, or they feel like they're drowning in darkness, Lord, would you turn their eyes to the light today? Would you turn their eyes to the king and his kingdom? And Lord, would you lead each of us wherever we are today in surrender to you? In Jesus' name, amen.